Hello, heroes, it's Stephanie here at HMA Heaven again, and it's our sixth Facebook Live and our second one with an HMO hero joining us here as a guest tonight. And tonight, um, do comment if you've got any questions. We've got some great questions, so thanks to Raj and the other people who've sent questions in. We will be answering those as we go through. So let me tell you about tonight's guest. I'm super excited to have him on the show. He's bought 24 properties in 24 months and held on to his portfolio all the way through the crash. He's built up an amazing lettings business from nothing to over 400 units managed and building a team of eight staff. So we're going to be talking to you about how to scale and systemize your business so it doesn't just turn into a bit of a nightmare and a full-time job. He's also run a business which will be of, of interest to you who were sources um, during the uh, sale and rent back period. Um, and so he'll, he's got some amazing tips on sourcing and he's also in HMO developing and he'll be talking to us about his current property deal where it's uh, going from a four bed to a nine bed at the Gables. And I know that some of you will have seen the photos and the videos on the HMO Heroes Facebook group. So without any further ado, let me welcome Gary Slater, you HMO hero. Welcome. It's great Hi. to have you on. Um, great to have you uh, with us today. And we've got so much to get through tonight that um, let's just crack on straight away. And we're going to start off with, could you tell us you know, a little bit about you and where you started off, Gary? Yeah, of course. So originally I'm from Nottingham, hometown. Um, I left school with that, but I mean, achieved a great deal in terms of results. Let's say I wasn't thinking of age. Um, I then fell into the printing industry. That was my background. That's what I did. Mm -hmm. I worked on the shop floor on machinery, uh, and I enjoyed that to, to such an extent. I didn't think I would, you know, shop floor of um, greasy guys. Um, yeah. I enjoyed that to such an extent. I went back to study as a mature student. Um, this culminated after, in five years of basically um, doing a degree in London, a business degree, something I thought I'd never do. Um, yeah. and, and that sort of background until I was about 21. So um, parents both self-employed, so I suppose that's been put into me really in terms of my, my ethos, how I think, work hard to get, mm -hmm. get what you want in life and um, don't give up. And mm -hmm. uh, so I then spent 12 years in a corporate career in printing, so mm -hmm. in corporate sales, driving around the UK, mm -hmm. a bit of international stuff. Uh, yeah. And then decided at the age of 35 that it was time to do something for myself. Uh, yeah. I take reins and saw a decline in the printing markets and being very competitive and I've always had an interest in property. I dabbled in it very, you know, a little bit in the past, like many people do, buying, selling their own property. I mm -hmm. um, decided to do something more uh, and that's where it all started, really. Fantastic. And I know that you had quite a high powered corporate job, lots of traveling involved all over the country and international. And then at the age of 35, your life changed, really, when you decided to go into property. And what, what happened next? What happened next was I... Um, I got it got more serious for me because it's actually my dad that put me on to the idea of looking at a chap called Ranjan Bhattacharya, which I'm sure most a lot of viewers your viewers will have come by, come across. Sorry, uh, and I went along to a one day training event in the West Midlands at this swanky Elizabeth, Elizabethan hotel. It was held on a Saturday, um, and this was back in 2006 uh, when everybody was talking about creative forms of purchasing property using um, memory down techniques as sort of thing. Uh, and I thought, I'll give that a go. The idea being that you could finance property very easily. Money was in ready supply. You know, it was back in the day where banks were throwing money at people. Yeah. Um, Good old days. I set a strategy to purchase 24 properties in 24 months, two years. Um, and it started happening. So it was direct to vendor marketing. I was yeah. doing this on the side of my full-time job. Gary, um, Gary. Gary, we've had a comment just about the volume. Could you talk up a bit? Because this is a juicy part. Um, so, Can you hear this? Is that okay? Yeah, that's a bit better. Um, so, yeah, so, guys, in case you missed that, we're just talking when Gary is now buying 24 properties in 24 months um, back in 2006. So, carry on, Gary. And so I started acquiring properties using these techniques and 
Uh, within two or three months, I'd got enough coming through in terms of vendor inquiries and deals being agreed that it gave me the confidence to, to ditch the job. So I, I ditched that job quite quickly. Um, yeah. Um, pretty well paid, you know, corporate, corporate role, sort of company car and all the trappings, if you like, like that. Yeah. Um, chucked it all in. I'd got a cushion behind me because I'd sold a property as well that I had for a number of years. Um, so that gave me two years' money, really. So I had two years' money behind me to sort of really take my time. But as it happened, it just took off. But yeah. that doesn't mean I was just tying up every deal I could possibly do because I was still very careful. Yeah. So I just meant I could sit back, relax, and do the right deal. And Great. So give us an idea um, for those of us who weren't buying and selling in the heyday where you could uh, buy and then remortgage out the same day, buy in the morning and remortgage at lunchtime. Um, and get get all your money out and extra in some cases. So give us um, the headlines of a typical deal of, of the type you're buying. It would be a normal two or three bed semi or terrace house situation. Um, typically ex local authority or very close to those areas. Uh, and a value might be, let's say market value of £100,000 for, for ease. Uh, be purchasing that property for 80, 82K, something like that. Mm -hmm. raising raising finance on 85 percent of the value of the property the, the real value of the property mm -hmm. so on day of completion you'd purchase it in the morning with bridging a bridging loan and then the afternoon you'd, you'd move across to the new lender at the 85 percent loan to value um and so you could cover your costs of purchasing that property as well as buying it mm -hmm. at worst mm -hmm. uh, so i the money down by the time the deal was done uh, and in fact you could as some would have turned it back then cash out and produce a, a, some um additional money that's coming out of the deal because of the loan, the loan to value being 85%. But of course, bear in mind that that's still borrowed money. It's not free money, so it's part of the mortgage. Yeah, even there. if it does feel like it. Um, and there are people in the market, and we've seen them come and go. People were doing some crazy things. I've seen people buy portfolio, build portfolios of hundreds of properties that aren't around anymore. And it, was, it was relatively easy, but it was about the marketing. It was getting in front of people. That was, yeah. that was the key. Yeah. Okay, uh, you are you, you do still sound a little bit fake, Gary, so I don't know if you can um, either get closer or just talk louder. Um, okay. But um, that, that's great stuff. And then I know that after that, you then went into, you set up another business, didn't you? After you got your 24 properties and things changed so in the world. What happened in this 24 property period was I think uh, I still carried on buying a, couple, a few more. Uh, then unfortunately, the, the market fell apart. The, the, credit market fell apart with the um, credit crunch in 2007, slash eight, um, we saw Northern Rock go, and uh, it made everybody re-look re at everything. Um, mm. It was a hard time. So I, I looked around and thought, well, what do I do next? You know, what, what should I do with my time? It's a mm -hmm. portfolio that was generating a good income, but what do I do with my, my time? So I then um, thought, I know what I'll do. I'll start sourcing properties for the sale and rent back market very niche, you know, particular, particularly focused on that. And um, started doing that for a year or two, started working well, uh, hooked up with a, a US-based hedge fund that were actually purchasing the properties through us. So we were arranging these things, acting as the intermediary. Mm. Uh, but unfortunately, again, the FSA got involved in that, which they did it for the right reasons. We understand that, you know, and everything we did was always above board. And we, we were sort of held up as being the guys that did it properly. Yeah. Was, so um, at that business, I know you had eight staff. Yeah, so we had eight staff, had guys on the road, had a BDM on the road, a business development manager that was out there meeting clients and making sure things were right. So we had to vet people and make sure we've got all their credentials and their income and expenditures. We had, to, we had to be able to evidence everything to what is now the FCA mm -hmm. uh, to make sure the file was compliant before we completed the transaction because yeah. uh, the penalties would be huge otherwise. Uh, but unfortunately, the... Um, the FSA regulated it to such an extent that, that the major hurdle in the end was uh, the vendors had to be able to demonstrate beyond any doubt that they had no other option than mm. uh, rent back their property because they were in the they were facing repossession and ultimately the lender was unwilling to help them anymore uh, and we found that we couldn't we just could not complete enough cases of that type it became very difficult. And the market just fell out, fell down, and everybody around us, we, we all backed out of it, and that was that. 
So we just but you had that a business. phenomenal funnel, didn't you? You had a phenomenal funnel to, to, to service eight staff. You had a phenomenal number of leads coming down your funnel and you were closing quite a few of them. So can you tell us about how you marketed to be able to source yeah. that many leads to sustain that sort of um, that sort of a business? It was all online. So it was all back online and it was all um, by, S by organic SEO means and also um, using um, pay per click, so Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. And at one point, we were spending in the region of five thousand pounds a month on, on pay per click. It was it was wow. that serious. It uh -huh. got that serious. Because we had to do so much to cover our cost because of the number of staff. Yeah, um, it was all it was all me really. I wasn't funded externally. It was all own money. So my portfolio was the backdrop of this business. Yeah, what was, what was funding our thing? Yeah. So um, yeah, it was a tough time. I uh, learnt a lot. So. Yeah. Really did learn a lot in that business, uh, and then when that when we decided to close that, I, th I looked around the office as you do, and you'd say, "Well, what do we do next?" And thinking myself, "What do I do next?" And within forty eight hours, I, I quickly worked out that I knew him in the office who I wanted around me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I thought, the next logical step in terms of what I'm doing, owning my properties, managing them myself, knowing where I want to go, is to set up a property management business. Uh, yeah. At the time, people said I was crazy. Yeah. So why would you do that? We've got over 140 competitors in Nottinghamshire. So wow. there's a lot of competitors, um, both sales and letting agents. Um, but yeah, it, it, again, that's quite a tough business, but it's grown and grown. It's got to a point now where it's, it's, it, it is really established and, and moving. Yeah. And uh, um, I've got about eight staff again, seven or eight staff, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's great. So let's talk about the HMO lettings business. And I know that's called uh, Slater and Bradley. I was hugely impressed because it's number one on Google for HMO management across the UK, uh, Slater and Bradley. Um, now, we have had a couple of questions about about the HMA management side of things. So um, we'll discuss those now. So Raj Sharma has asked, who are the essential people in a property management team and how do you start putting them together when starting out? So, so yeah, okay. So some of this is fundamentally really important to any letting business and letting manage, property management company. So um, you, you need you need great um, next, what we call letting negotiators at the front of the office. Mm -hmm. People that are, that are cutting as they're dealing with all the inquiries coming in, uh, conducting viewings, processing applications and getting uh, those to a point where they can move forward and then be, and then on completion how we move the tenant in put them into the back office and call it the back office um into the property management function so mm -hmm. the property managers then run that so we've got letting like letting negotiators at the front mm -hmm. handling all the in, all the stuff coming in mm -hmm. and we've got the property managers handling the, the properties around mm -hmm. that we've also got other functions so in our office because we are 60 40 split with HMO and single lets. We've got one particular individual who looks after all the fire compliance, amongst other compliance matters. But mm -hmm. obviously, with HMO's fire compliance is mandatory, can't be avoided, you've got to do it right. And um, that's really important. So, we've built a real reputation for doing things properly uh, here mm -hmm. in Nottingham. Um, mm -hmm. Yet to see another agent do what we do in terms of the mm -hmm. micromanagement of our HMOs. Mm -hmm. Fire and also just just general tenancy and occupancy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, aside from that, um, you, you need another. You need obviously to have a right hand man. My right hand man is Will Brandley. He's Brandley at Slater and Brandley. Yeah. So he was made director and company a couple of years back. And I know I could probably step back from the business for six months or six months quite easy, and it wouldn't be affected by me not being here. Which mm. Yeah. Um, Will deals with the single let side of what we are, what we do, and I deal with all the shared accommodation, so the HMOs and non-HMO licensed properties as well, the smaller ones. Um, and we both, you know, we have it very organised like that, so we're very focused for our clients. Fantastic. So for you, Raj, there there are uh, there's three roles we've mentioned: the lettings negotiator role, some people call it lettings manager. There's the uh, property management role, um, that's like the customer service and the maintenance side of things. And then there's the, I know that you do this exceptionally well within your business, uh, the marketing of your business and um, to bring in new landlords and look after the landlords that you already have. So there's the four. That's probably, that's, probably the, that's probably the bit I didn't mention, the marketing. So the marketing is something that, again, Will and I share. 
I yeah. spend a good deal of time on it. And as you said yourself, for SEO for HMO management yeah. in the UK, we, we're number one on that. And that's not by um, by chance. We do spend a lot of time on um, just repetitively putting things out there and building that building that following, really. Yeah. Okay. And um, I, I was just about to say something which I forgot. Oh, yes. How, you, you asked, how do you start off when you're just starting, Raj? How do you get all these roles? within it well obviously a lot of the roles are going to be you but even at the beginning there are roles you can outsource so all of this sort of back office side of things um before we took on luke full time then we we outsourced that uh to a virtual assistant and uh, so that really helped our business grow and i can tell you i can tell more about how that used to work uh beforehand and next week we've got abigail uh, Dempsey coming on the show and that is her business it's about VAs and not only providing VAs but also training those VAs to work in your property business so that is really one not to miss so um, thanks for that Gary and also um, Raj has asked which professional bodies can help you to be uh, HMO compliant property manager so yeah um, okay so out there if you do some searches online you'll find the government pages which will give you the information about the man HMO management regulations, the mm -hmm. order. Um, that's really important. Unfortunately, I have to say that when you go out there and you look for information about managing HMOs, mm -hmm. it's very grey. Mm -hmm. You probably know this. Grenf the Grenfell inquiry that's going on at the moment is a, is a classic example of where the rules are just there's nothing. There's nothing very clear mm -hmm. in anything that in the HMO in the HMO world. Very little. Uh, and what we do is we go belt and brace and just make sure we, we go over and above. So mm. on site here, we have 32 bed HMOs where I'm situated. Yeah. On site where this is. So um, having something of that scale tells us what we need. Yeah. And so we yeah. have five assessments taken out. We just employ experts in their fields, third parties that advise us on what we do. We don't go out to any one, any one party. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. I don't even, personally, I don't even read to local authorities around us. I mean, we, we go by what they say, but actually, again, they're very grey. Uh, yeah, they're not. Name and you've got to just, you, you basically need to go and see some quality things that are going on there and understand the good and bad. Great. And Raj, the, the, the schemes you can join is obviously the Property Redress Scheme or the Public Ombudsman Scheme, the Information Commissioner's Office. You need to have the Public Liability Insurance and the Professional Indemnity Insurance. And it's an idea to be involved in a landlord uh, group such as the RLA or the NLA, just so you can keep abreast of new things coming up. But you're already doing that, being involved in the Facebook group. Uh, we are members of Arla here. We have been for about five years now. So um, yeah, I have to say until recently, it was probably a badge. You know, we, yeah, they, they check our accounts once a year. We're, we're audited and all the rest of it. That's all good. But um, we don't hear much from them. Uh, mm -hmm. in, you know, but I think that's going to change. I'm pretty sure it's going to change in the next couple of years. And we're starting to see, uh, see that coming through now. Mm. Okay. And then we've got Joseph. Uh, Joseph Haber has asked... What are the key steps in systemizing an HMO business? Okay, so probably much like yourself, Stephanie, we've got a CRM system. So we've got a customer relationship management system that um, holds all of our information. So it diarizes all of our uh, mandatory fire checks on all our properties. And typically in a six bed, for example, which is normal, the normal sort of sweet spot for HMO, these things need, they should be checked once a month. That would be my... Um, be my suggestion somebody should be going there once a month checking uh, the fire detection system you know mostly lighting uh, doors closing properly things not missing things not broken checking mm -hmm. long-term locks are working you know make sure things are engaging properly and just happening and that should be logged in the fire book the fire risk assessment on the back on a monthly basis and obviously then appointing third-party engineers to go out and service those fire detection and emergency lighting systems either six monthly if it's a panel if it's a big system uh or annually if it's just integrated smokes and uh, basic great okay thanks and i think i think joseph it's just a case of getting all that um within your business obviously all that systemized with checklists and dates for people to go and that's the actual thing it's just documenting all the processes that you're involved in and making checklists so that every person within the business who's carrying out those roles knows exactly what to do and can just look at the checklist to make sure that they're performing to your standards. Um, so the next, 
when I go out in the market, I, I see a lot of a lot of bad stuff happening. And yeah. We, yeah. Often, we often say we have a phrase here which goes along the lines of uh, there's another there's another great property in the wrong hands. Yes. Oh gosh, I know, I know. We we could go on at length about that one. <laughs> but um the sec Joseph's second question is what are the common pitfalls when you're managing a large number of HMOs? Um you've got to be careful who you take into the properties, so tenants. Mm. You know, the yeah. tenants the, yeah. we've had a classic example of just this today. So you can have um, a house upset by just one person. Yeah. Um, if any of been students, and, and that you'll probably know, is, you know, one person can upset their whole apple cart, just because they're, they're, they're not tidy, uh, inconsiderate with n noise, nuisance, anything like that, smoking, start smoking weed in the property, whatever it might be. Yeah. Uh, I'd say number, number one is being careful who's in the property. It's, it's very easy to fill any, any property, HMO or otherwise, uh, it's more difficult to, to fill it with the right people. Yeah. Get that bit right, and you're, you're halfway there. Yeah, absolutely. I totally agree with that. We've had our, our we've had some uh, some classics um, that not wanting to repeat kind of classics. But um, so our, our our top one is that ensuring the customer service is maintained when you've got a larger number. And again, that is about systemizing and make sure that the processes can be carried out as your team grows by anyone on your team to the same standard um, and that's checking against the tech uh, against the checklist and also it's about knowing that when somebody's locked out at 1 a.m you know what your process is uh, you know what to do uh, there is a process for it and as new things happen that you then document the process for dealing with those new things so that the second third and fourth time that they happen your process is already in place and any of your team can deal with it without uh, the need for your involvement. Um, so any other common pitfalls for a um, large number of properties? Um, it's very easy again to take properties on, and you'll know this probably, to take a number of properties on and think, oh, well, we can sort that out, and I'm sure we can work our way through it. Uh, you've got to be, you've got to be, you've got to be a little bit fussy about what you do take on, and not just jump at anything. Because yeah. That can cost you a whole lot of time and money. Absolutely. And we, are, we actually had a few comments. Um, Martin is saying we just lost three tenants because of one other. Oh, no. Is that in your new HMO, Martin? Oh, not the orange one, please. Don't, don't let it be the orange one. Um, Anton saying I hear about this all the time. What happened in your situation, Martin? Well, hopefully we can check back in and see what happened in Martin. We are going to do a whole Facebook Live about this because, as you know, Martin and some of the others who are watching will know we've had our own situations, you know, from HMO heaven to HMO hell sort of sort of scenario. But we 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 haven't got time to delve deep into that one. Oh, Martin said it's not the orange ones. That's okay then. Um, there's, there's, there's a, I mean, the list goes on as to what can go wrong and what the pitfalls are. It, it's um, when you're in the business, and particularly if you're managing more of them. Uh, yeah, it's a huge list. Where to start is... Yeah. But I think those are the top two, aren't they? Get the right people in and get your processes so that you can provide that level of customer service and, and service for the property, service to the customers. I think those are great uh, top two. If you get those in place, you know, um, well, I won't say nothing can go wrong. <laughs> but uh, let's move on to our next question, which is from Paul Stevens. So thanks for this, Paul. How do you vet prospective tenants? What criteria do you use in order to get the most reliable ones? I think this is very pertinent. Um, so okay. fire away. So Well, I, I I've got go on. You're still there? Yes, I'm still here. I'm still here. Okay, so I've actually got a top five because um, when we had this sort of HMO health scenario, um, we actually added to our to our list. So the the top the first two things are that the person has to be polite, friendly, respectful at the viewing. And you obviously get a great uh, feel for somebody in person. And then they have to meet your onboarding requirements, whatever those are. And that's the paperwork side of things. So in our case, they need to have a job. They need to be able to afford the rent. Usually we're looking for somebody who's, who's on six months or longer. And then we've recently, well, we've put together now the five 
issues that we see if they're clustered together and somebody has three or more of these, then that's a red flag for us and we wouldn't be looking to move forward. So the number one is that getting all the information, the onboarding information is really difficult and time consuming. And they're almost trying to hide. Well, they are trying to hide and obscure the truth in, in what they send across to you. And the second thing is that they say they're living with their parents. So therefore, there's no landlord reference available. The third thing that affordability is questionable. So they require a guarantor. Fourth is that the parents are not willing to provide a guarantor, even though they allegedly live with the parent. Yeah. And the fifth one is a new job. So none of those on their own would be enough to say no. But if they've got a cluster of those things, then definitely we wouldn't be looking to be going ahead with them. The sound has gone again. Is it? Can you move a bit closer to your? Is it your laptop? Yeah, yeah. It, it goes bad, and then it, it's it's not so good, which is a shame because you're saying such good stuff. So let's talk now. We've we've answered the questions that were all about HMO um, management. I'll. I'll, I'll check. I'll check in in case there's anything else come in. But also, I know that as well as the standard sort of uh, management and single let management, HMO management, you also do rent to rent as well. Yeah. And um, so we have had a we have had a question about that. I don't know if you can remember back to your first one, because um, Warren Simmons has asked. I'm looking to get my first rent to rent HMO. So anything that would help me? Um, I don't know if you've got any tips for people who are just getting into it. Yeah, I think when our very first HMO, uh, rent to rent, was actually this this big property here, this 32 bedroom. Really? What way to start? Was our introduction. Yeah. Um, we didn't we didn't call it rent to rent. So we basically used to focus on commercial lease. Yes. Uh, we call it. Um, we, I don't tend to use the word rent, the phrase rent to rent. No, um, no, I know. Um, but I think that's where we benefit from the fact that we, we had a big one to start with. Yeah. We took it on. And uh, there was a lot learned within the first 12 months. We then could scale into, the, into a business and doing it yeah. a lot more often. Uh, the question, sorry, was um, how, to, how to get started or how. Do many people come to you as an agent and say uh, rent to rent that uh, people using that shorthand uh, who want to rent your property off you on a rent to rent basis? We don't you think get people pitching other rent to renters pitching to us. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Like okay. Uh, so who's, who's bad? What makes a good pitch? I know obviously in your case you're not going to say yes ever because that's what you do. But um, what makes a good pitch and what should people avoid? I think well, when we start that, it's all about just trying to do a really good deal and that was all it was uh where we are five years down the road now is starting to do more stuff where we're actually investing in the properties and it's like anything in anything in business you learn you go along and um that doesn't mean you become less less you become you do more risky deals it just means you're to put something into the deal so actually mm -hmm. make it work you see the long-term game plan mm. um does that make sense yeah 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 absolutely so, yeah. but when people come into your office yeah. um, and they're a, a rent to rent person using that shorthand and they want to rent your property. They don't uh, come in, they only ever ring us, they've never, they've never been in. Oh, um, really? By, by phone call. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's the only way. And I generate rent to rent leads, as we call them, uh, yeah. through marketing what I call a guaranteed rent product on yeah. the Capitum website. So, yeah. on the Capitum website. Uh, there is a, a link for landlords, you know, guaranteed rent for landlords, and yeah. that's uh, one of the um, ways in which we attract that type of person. Yeah. Uh, and, and it, to be fair, if you're looking to um, get into rent to rent, uh, probably the biggest tip I could give anybody is to say look look for look for tired or reluctant landlords. Mm. Uh, have probably got they've got the property already, and they've grown tired or they've moved away, and it's just become a hassle for them. Mm. Uh, they're the people we do deal with most of the time. Mm. And where do you find them? Do they come to you because you've got your agency, or do you do yeah, some marketing? You know, do, do, um, majority of it's outbound marketing, so it's you know direct to vendor marketing using HMO lists and things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just um, repetitive stuff that just takes time to build. And it's and and once you've made a contact, 
It's about following up that contact in a, you know, in a few months time. So they may be really happy right now. They may have done a deal with a different agent, but uh, I had one just recently that we've just agreed in the last couple of months where uh, this guy had done a deal with another agent. Mm -hmm. um, I felt fairly certain it was going to fall apart because I know who they are. Yeah. And, um, I know about the whole, when I spoke to the guy six or eight weeks ago, he was very happy. He said, no, everything's working really well. Thanks, Gary. Everything's working right. He was pretty good now, you know about it. <laughs> uh, and then about a month ago, he rang me and said, unfortunately, it's no longer working well. Oh. I'm going to you again. Yeah. And I've done a deal with him. It, it took very little time. So we'd already built some trust and together. And I've got to know him for about a year or more. Uh, yeah. Met him once and spoke on the phone most of it. Um, and obviously he built built some trust there and the deal was done in an hour. He came, we came up, we came up to Nottingham, met up with me, looked around the property, had a coffee with him as well. Deal done. And I knew the numbers and that was it. It was very easy because we built we built a level of trust up. Yeah. That that's a great story of uh, persistence. Do you have a way of making sure that you get back to people, you know, in two months, three months, or whatever it is? How how I do you diarise it? it? I think you just diarise it again in no. the diary. I no. think um, it takes nothing, does it, for anybody just to sit down occasionally or every I don't know, every few weeks, sit down for a couple of hours and just think what you're doing and why you're doing it and who, mm -hmm. you, who haven't you spoken to for a while. I think mm -hmm. this again last last week with a few really big opportunities we've got here in Nottingham, people that we've got on a you know on the back burner that we hope may come to something. These are big ones. These are sort of 15, 20, 25 bed HMOs, big things. Wow. Uh, that are mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And uh, you know, we've built a relationship and um I'm sure one of those will come off sometime soon, one of those three. I'm loving the sound of 15, 20 or 25 HMOs. That sounds really good. So I know that sort of ties into you sourcing your um, the big development that we've seen on the group, the Gables, which is a four to nine bed development. So can you tell us a bit about how you source that? Yeah, so that's yeah, a property. Can you hear me again? Yeah, it, it, it's a bit, it has been a bit difficult, I must say, but if you just keep, keep yourself a bit forward and uh, talk up a bit and we should be, we should be okay. I've heard that there an echo and that sort of makes me think something's not right. Um, so this property was on the market over a year ago. Um, actually, it was on the market for about six months prior to that. But a year ago, I came across it and it was looking very tired. That's what drew my attention. Yeah. The wreck. And if you look yeah. back at it, if anybody was to go back and look at the videos again on the... Uh, Captain Investments Facebook page is a, there's a 16 weeks of it, the, the build. Um, it was it was a bare brick. There were no ceilings any, anywhere in the property. Uh, there was a living in this property. Yeah. Um, and it was in a dire condition. So it was on the market for about 200, I think 200K. Um, mm -hmm. Rather than approach the agent, I thought I'd knock on the door. Mm -hmm. I've never bought, I have never bought an investment property through an agent ever. Everything's bought really? through a direct vendor. The only properties I've ever bought myself are my own, my own home, family home. Three. Yeah. So, um, so it was direct. Knocked on the door, made a friend very quickly, invited they invited me in, had a little time. We had this uh, negotiation that went on for probably three or four months, backwards and forwards, by text and phone call. Um, yeah. Basically, it was me saying the bottom line was I didn't think the property would ever sell for two hundred k or anything quite like it because it had no back garden. Yeah. Natural property, Edwardian. Uh, detached property had no back garden wouldn't lend itself to a family uh, and they took that on board and fully you know completely agreed uh, and in the end we agreed to purchase one hundred eighty thousand. whilst i was purchasing it we um, submitted um application for planning because obviously trying to turn this into nine bedrooms it goes into a whole planning classification of its own Super yeah. generous. um that took i think about eight or ten weeks to go through uh, right. And by this point, I was ready to complete on the purchase of it. And mm -hmm. um, I got the planning, completed on the purchase, and then went, went and started um, converting this thing. Um, initially, thought I could probably get it done for about 140K, something like that. It's ended up costing about 180, but we've actually been doing the photography there today to list it. So we're, yeah. we're at the end. I can't wait to see it, Gary, because uh, it looks really impressive. And I know that, well, you walked me through some of the numbers, so it'd be really interesting to um, have you back on for the, the revaluation. So uh, do you want to just give us the headlines of, of how it's working? As a, as yeah, a, the, numbers, the numbers, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah, so this is um, nine bedrooms of varying sizes. Uh, we have six ensuite rooms and three rooms share a smart shower room. 
it's I say back to brick, so it's completely rewired, plumb, replumbed, every bit of plasterboard, every bit of timber, everything is it's brand new inside. And the range will range from four two five to five two five calendar month, inclusive of all bills. Mm -hmm. um, it's just really smart. I, I don't expect it to hang around at all. We've got one parking space for um, one rear. You had a planning consultant, though, didn't you, to get that one through? Because I know that planning is an issue in a lot of areas. Uh, sorry, parking even is. Yeah, I have an architect who's also something of a planning, uh, you know, planning consultant also knows, knows what she's doing. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, very experienced. Uh, the planners uh, had, we had quite a lot of objection from neighbours about parking. I wasn't aware of it until after the planning had been approved, funny enough. Tends mm. to be the way these things happen. Um, sorry, somebody's trying to get my attention. And... Um, the the count the local council knocked that on the head and said look there's, there's so much local amenities here because it's just around the corner from the main um, shops that uh, we don't have an issue with transport around here we and we believe that half the people in occupying this property won't have won't have transport of their own yeah so yeah, um, yeah. so there wasn't an issue um, yes it's a great property fantastic so um, tell us about how you financed it because that's that's um, a something brought for a lot of people so how did you how did you finance this deal yeah so the initial purchase of it I did I did have to sell a property to raise some finance because I have always been self-funded up to this point so uh, I was wondering I'm, I'm quite I'm quite open but it's 180k purchase price um, I put a 35 45k deposit into it 135k on a normal um, one year development loan, one of the high, one of the mainstream um, HMO lenders. I won't say who, but it's one of them that everybody talks about. And um, and then, then for the first time ever, I've used bridging finance for the development of the property, yeah. Yeah. with some of my other cash as well. Mm -hmm. um, so it's been very, it's been an expensive uh, project from a financing point of view. Yeah, the, the running costs from an interest point of view alone are about three thousand pounds a month currently. So, yeah, yeah. Um, Going forward, I probably wouldn't really want to use bridging finance if I can again. Mm -hmm. um, what I'd rather do is start looking to JV with maybe with some people. So yeah. just just a handful of people that uh, got on very well that could um, help fund the development cost perhaps for a, a very healthy return against what we're getting in the bank. So I, I need to do it more. I need to be more um, more competitive on the pricing in terms of the costs of financing the project. Yeah, yeah and do more and do more of it. It's a great way to get started, and it's quite straightforward. It, or do, was it straightforward going through the bridge process? The, uh, to, no. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, so the bridge was um, secured against a couple of my other HMO properties, and the paperwork in that was immense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it went on. For so all together for that process, because you think of bri bridging as a, a faster way of getting finance. Um, so do you think it just took just as long as an ordinary uh, mortgage to get in place? <laughs> We had something like five solicitors involved. Yeah. We've got, we've got the lender. I forget why now with that. With that. Oh, excuse me, excuse me. We're, we're, okay, Irene. we're okay, Irene. We're okay, Irene. Yeah. That's, uh, I love the Irene. The cleaners just popped in. So. Maybe anyway. it was four solicitors, maybe, but it was, yeah, it was just drawn out, you know, really drawn out. And I think. Oh, uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Irene. Irene's going to be asleep. <laughs> She's nice. such a girl. Okay. That, that, that side can be improved upon. I've done some JVs with people on straightforward flips where we've bought properties to sell, uh, where I I found them, they funded them completely. So yes. in the buyer, the owner, very nice and clean, and then on the sale of the property, I've just invoiced my share of the profit for my. That's you know, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's really well, I just want to. I just, that's the sort of thing I'm looking to have going forward. Something really simple. Um, yeah. Some simple flips, and then use some of that money to go forward with your more HMO development. I'm not, I'm not looking to really do any any flips, particularly in near term. My, my business really is about building more property to hold for long term, and ultimately looking down the road if we could really get those, looking at some build to rent things and proper. Yeah. I love this comment. Um, we've had a comment. It's Stacy Crowley who said, "What parking space?" Because um, that's amazing. Balls. Um, so I'm guessing, Stacy, that you've tried yeah. to get an HMO maybe with less or one parking space and not gone through. So really, hats off to you, guys, for getting that one. Yeah, it's probably down to location. It might be that in that case that um, you know, I don't know. I tend to find that if you've if you've got, I, I've had planning. Mm -hmm. Objections 
on all, on probably all of my HMOs. But yeah. because they're in locations that are very well served by local transport, by trams or buses or whatever it might be. Uh huh. And I've been able to sell the idea through my previous experience of owning HMOs that actually exactly. it's about a 50 50 split of the yeah. trans own vehicles versus those that don't. Yeah. Those, you know, buses and bikes and whatever. Um, yeah. They've just gone through. You know, without any, you know. And also, I think a planning consultant is key. Obviously, you're very experienced as well, which helps. But having a planning consultant, um, I think, is is key as well. So because uh, I know that lots of people are interested in HMO management and it's managing, uh, sorry, refurbishment. It's the projects, managing the projects, managing the contractors, having the right designs and all of that sort of thing. So what's your top tip? Because you've become more into HMO development side of things now um, and you've managed uh, quite a, few, a series of successful HMO developments that have run to time. Um, what's your uh, top tips for, for that? To look after the team. So, and, oh, I saw that. Oh yeah, uh, I use boiled sweets. <laughs> Uh, to look after the team, so the team, not the trades, um, to look after them, make sure you pay them quickly, mm -hmm. um, look after their welfare on site, mm -hmm. and, and also protect them from the vultures out there. So uh, what I mean by that is we're, we're constantly approached by landlords trying to pick our trades off, you know, mm -hmm. if they can do this for me, you know, mm -hmm. somebody do that for me. If we gave the contact out every time for all of our trades, we'd never get anything done because they'd be too busy. Exactly. Um, so we protect them like that. That for me is a, a tip. I know we live in this apparently this sort of share society where everybody wants to share everything. Mm. For me, that is something I'm particularly you know, careful about. And we are in Slater and Brandy as well. Yeah. Um, and you have to learn at the end of the day dealing with human beings. So again, it's understanding that if they're not, if they're not feeling well, they're not feeling well. They can't turn in. Um, mm. Just because a contract has a bad week, don't don't write them off. But also, if they turn turn out to sort of let you down regularly be prepared to let them go and, and move on and yeah the last three or four years i have had to alter one or two members of the team that i've built because i project manage my properties myself mm. um in order that things get done both in a timely way and people work together mm. various well, the various trades actually pull together um, because that's really important it's a lot of balls in the air and to, to deliver consistently that's a skill and you've got this amazing team together now which you've built up over many years and it's all coming to fruition for you now so yeah, I'd, say all, I'd say they're all um every one of my trades personal trades that work on my developments they're, they're quite fanatical about their work mm -hmm. um, my joiners you know if it's not right they'll undo it and put it right they're not they're not the, uh, they won't try and pull the wool over my eyes as such they know what we're looking for uh, and everything just works perfectly you know, everything's just got to be right and clean. Right, so we've had a couple of comments. So I'm just going to read those in. So Stacey's, oh, hi, Lucky. Lucky's hoping to get the recording. And hi, Lois. Um, so Stacey's asking, he's not in Wrexham. Um, I think that's where, well, presumably that's where Stacey is. Any tips for working with planning departments? Um, yeah, it's not a bad thing to get to know them. I, I'm not. I was going to say I'm not in their pockets. I'm absolutely not that. Um, mm. But to get to know them so they know that you are a um, a known force, if that's right, mm. right thing to say. So they just, just have a few, two or three people. You find a reason to go and talk to them, to go actually and visit them and see them rather than just do it on the phone. So mm. it's a reason to sort of get the, get the message across that you're here to do the right thing, mm. to make, to build the right properties for, for the market. And producing HMO properties because there's always a lot of objections generally with local local neighbours um, that you're here to house the right people in the properties because every time I've ever done one they always think it's going to be rowdy students or a yeah. house full of um, um, beaten women or something like that and, and I have to convince them it's not, uh, well and it's, and it's not until the places are finished that they, they believe me often and uh, I can tell you right now that when I stand outside the gables over the last few weeks People just carry on walking past saying, what a fantastic job you guys have made of that. You know, what a mm. transformation. That property's been gaia for 25 years. It's been looking like a, you know, I don't know. Yeah. Careful what I say. It's a great satisfaction, isn't it, when you're bringing a, a property back into use and, and turning it from, you know, just in your case, unused into a lovely home for people. 
Um, obviously, we're up for the business side of things, but that's an, a lovely side effect of, of, of what we do. So, the, maintenance, the ongoing maintenance is really important. Just keep ticking these things, keep them looking really smart. And mm. you won't be far wrong. And that's, that's what would be one of my tips in terms of um, making your life easier. So, so, we, as a rule, we'll go into all property, HMO properties once a month, do all those fire checks I told you about. So, mm. spot things like leaks if they are there. But also every three months, we'll do a full inspection on the property to make sure there are no issues anywhere in any room. Mm -hmm. uh, even looking at the shower trays for other little leaks and things. Um, mm -hmm. This and that just saves you a whole lot of problems down the road. And it can be well, well, that must be continual inspections then. No, what do you need uh, to do? Well, thankfully, it's not me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of work. Um, so Lucky, Lucky said that she wants the recording. Just to let you know, Lucky. If you click in the group under videos, you can see all of our this video and all the previous videos as well. So let's come back to you, Gary. And a lot of people are, well, some people are like you growing a business, but a lot of people are just starting out. And um, what advice would you give to somebody who's just starting out now in HMO management? HMO management, i.e. Or rent. Investors buying their own property, yeah. I, um, I would turn what I've done a little on its head. What I'm doing right now is I've just started another project in the last couple of weeks, which is um, going back on one or two of my smaller three bed properties and can very simply converting them into smaller HMOs. Mm. So I know Julian Marie talks a lot about minimos and other mm -hmm. people do, and, and there are a lot of pros to doing that. Mm. So if you've got any, if you've already hold a property, and it's you know it's, it's very simple to convert it just by from a fire point of view to make it fire compliant fire mm -hmm. doors in closures intermittent strips in doors um, interlinked smokes fire extinguishers some fire blankets that's about it as long as your windows have got the right size openings um you can convert a property into a smaller mini mini most julie would call it a three bed um for, for a fraction of the cost of what i've been doing my properties for yeah uh, and, uh, Provided you can um, let them for a reasonable rate, you should be able to produce about five hundred pounds a month profit. Yeah, so that's, that's the numbers I'm working on, and actually, uh, I'm sure I could buy those properties much quicker. Exactly, so I'm much quicker and buy them quicker. There's, there's there's one on every street. Exactly, there's so many of them. Um, and the other thing you've got is that even after October 2018, when the new regulations come in. Those will be unlicensed. Obviously, you've got to have them up to standard and fire safety and all the rest of it, but they, they won't require licensing, which is another plus point for the three and the four bed um, minimos. So I think a lot of people will be going down that road. So now is a great time to you know capitalise on it. Yeah, you may still end up with selective licensing, depending on where you are, uh, mm. city of which parts mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But that's not something to be particularly concerned about, I don't think. I think, but I think uh, one of the main pros for me in doing the smaller mini mode is the ability to resell that property at some point in the future to the new yeah. market. Yeah. Uh, just bear in mind that all of my HMOs to, to this point have been um, converted specifically for this use. Mm. So to convert them back into anything like a family home or into flats or something to divide them up again would cost a lot of money. So they have to work. Uh, whereas a, a, a mini mo, um, we'll call it. Um, can we put on a? Can you could literally just take the fire closers off the fire doors, and the house would look yeah. quite quite normal. You know, it wouldn't be anything unusual to put it on the market in a matter of days. Um, yeah, having to alter walls or do anything. Mm -hmm. So, um, but just be very careful with lender. Make sure obviously the lender's aware, or or get it onto a product that is a HMO product or whatever. That's, that would be my my tip. Great. So that's a great tip. Um, looking to go into the minimos. Now you've been through a lot of tough times in property. You bought twenty four properties in twenty four months, and then um, there were some well tough times when we went into the crash and so on. Getting through that, and I know that you had a, a couple of problem tenants and all all of that, all the various things that can happen when you're buying that type of property. Um, but you stayed the course, and you managed to hold on to uh, your portfolio throughout the crash and come out the other side and just go large. So what advice would you give to people who are going through those tough times in property um, to get through? Okay, so I'd say that 
all too often we see on Facebook and in networking groups and all the rest of it, people buying flash cars and flash watches and all the holidays and all the rest of it. I think it's just really important to get your feet on the ground. Mm-hmm. I'm very careful even today what I what I do, you know, money wise, because you've you've got to you've got to look after the num- look after the numbers, the money, and um, stand firm. You've got to really stand firm and just be careful. And uh, I mean, when I when I set when I bought those twenty four properties in twenty four months, I created something of an issue uh, for a number of years because boilers started going every winter on some of these things, and I was probably replacing two or three every year, and so just that alone was quite an expense against mm-hmm. each individual property. A number of them needed refurbishing because the kitchens were in bad ways because they had never been touched. And so I did spend, I mean, I've had the majority of those probably 12 years now. Yeah, 12 mm-hmm. years, 40, yeah, 47 now. So uh, they're, they're at a point now where they're all done and you know dusted, but I'm, I'm not your typical landlord. I do go to the trouble of making sure that all my properties are electrically safe as well. So they've all always had five year periodic inspections on them. You know, I do mm. want to sleep at night and, and that costs money. But um, I have a nice car, but apart from that, I'm not materialistic as such. I don't wear designer clothes or uh, go out drinking a lot or anything. I think well, you keep, you keep yourself under the radar. Until this cables, um, I didn't, you know, I've not seen you really online, so to speak, apart from knowing that you're number one in HMA management in the UK <laughs> on Google. Um, I haven't really seen you, so it's great that you're now putting out the videos and so on, and sort of, I think it's good to have a bit of visibility. So your top tip really is keep your feet on the ground. Don't go crazy. Absolutely. Feet on the ground, and um, if you're in property, if, you, if you're in property, remember you're in business, and you're in business to generate a profit, and you can only generate a profit if you continue, if you can continue to invest in the property so you've mm. got to hold to hold some money back always to be able to do that mm-hmm. and we've had a comment in and it's from anton and he says loving the tips gary so i'll move this blind sorry all right okay um oh well That's i'm glad nice. that was quick because i was trying to think <laughs> anton, yeah? <laughs> get rid of the cleaner stephanie that's stacy that was a long time ago stacy but thanks for that i like it so yeah that's that's your your tips on how to get through the challenge and i just want to uh, bring up something uh gary that you mentioned to me before we went live on the call and that was that you just got a lead today through a website that you had when you had the uh sale and rent back business many years ago you had several websites where you're getting your leads from um, and you still got those websites all online. And uh, so, tell me a bit about that. Bringing the so, leads, to you. yeah. There is a, there is a site, um, nationalpropertybuyers.co.uk, which mm-hmm. about, about twelve years now. Mm-hmm. Uh, it sits out there. It's, it's it's fairly dormant. It generates leads all over from all over the country. Mm-hmm. I'll be frank. I've tried to monetize that over the years and tried to work with third parties to see if they would take on the leads and do something with it because I can't do everything. Mm. Um, and this never works. So n- never really works. So what I do now is I just focus on the leads that come in locally. And, mm. um, I came in a few, uh, two or three, two or three weeks ago, just a couple of miles away from the office again here, and um, we're starting a negotiation on the property. Uh, the chap called me yesterday, asked me if I could meet him at short notice today at the property, which I've done. I did do at four o'clock, mm-hmm. um, and I just need to do a bit more due diligence to make sure it, you know it's something I can do something with. Mm-hmm. Um, that, that could be. That could be great. Yeah, could could work. Fantastic. Um, so Gary, I know that you you did do some training. We ne- we ne- we never even gave them um, a mention, but I know that that will have changed your mindset and that would have helped you um, stand the course when uh, many others were going by the wayside back in the early days, going through the crash and moving forwards. Uh, whereas, uh, and I know a lot of lettings businesses. Um, what's the word, uh, plateau at, uh, you know, say a sub 200 property, if you, you're well over double that, including a, a, a really substantial HMO portfolio. Um, so what would you say are your uh, habits that let you do that? So either mindset tips or actual habits of things that you do most days? Um, one of the biggest is lists. Mm. So I remember reading a book many years ago. I used to, and I still am an avid follower of Richard Branson, and uh, I remember mm. reading, reading his book many years ago. He he writes lists no matter what time of day. Mm. Uh, we talk about writing them down on paper, but uh, I put them on a phone in lists and prioritise them. So and I put them down there to make sure I don't miss them. 
mm -hmm. um, to prioritize them in order of those things that order priority uh, that are going to generate the maximum return from either in time or money. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and to probably one of the top tips would be to always try and tackle the, the hardest thing first to make yeah. the day go easier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Put the biggest problem out the way first and then move on to uh, everything else because the rest of the day should be easier. Exactly. But, Never want to eat that frog in the morning. Happy for thought. breakfast. Um, anything else I can think about? Uh, just persistence. Just keep going. Just keep yeah. going. And uh, learn, learn. You know, there'll, be, there'll be some little failures. There'll be lots of lessons. Still learning every day. Um, you never stop learning in this business. I think if you stop learning, you, if you believe you know it all, mm. you really don't. You can't believe anybody knows what you're doing property. Yeah. There are so many strategies and ways of doing things. Exactly. Well, thank you so much, Gary, for coming on tonight. It's been an absolute pleasure and a delight. I'm so pleased you came on. I know you're going on holiday to Greece tomorrow. Yeah, thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. And what we'll do is we're going to put the details up and links to your uh, Slater and Black Brandley, uh, the lettings agent, and also your Capitan Investments business so that people can see. If I can find it, I'll do the, um, I'll just put the property the other the other website you mentioned your sourcing yeah. uh, website that you've had up for a long time so that people can see and, and, and can get in touch with you on your facebook page and all of your other bits and pieces so um thank you so much and, and have a fantastic holiday don't think of us uh over here in the cold well i was saying the cold it's not cold it's, it's it's absolutely lovely but i don't think it'll be quite as nice as greece so, uh, and thank you to you all who watched live. It's been great to have you on and thanks for the comments. Oh, uh, there is another comment. I'm just going to quickly check um, because it's not telling me who the names are on here and see. Uh, uh, thanks to you both. Oh, that's Stacey again. Oh, that's great. Great. Thanks for your comments, Stacey, tonight and to everyone else who's commented. And just to let you know that next week, um, if you've ever wanted to get rid of all the paperwork from your business and you've heard that you should have a virtual assistant, you kind of want to get a virtual assistant, but you don't know how to find the, the right one and train that person. Um, next week, we're having Abigail Dempsey come on and she's an Australian whiz and she's got a system uh, where she can find the VAs for you, train the VAs and you can get all the paperwork and back office off your desk. So, um and t I know, I know, it sounds great. Well, you don't need that. You've got a full office. <laughs> but it is great if you're just starting out or, or you're just um, yourself and you just don't want to do it anymore, but you don't want to take anybody on full time. Um, that That's a great message. So I think that's it. Um, so it's bye from Gary. Thank you, bye. And bye from me. And we will see you again next week. Uh, have a great trip, Gary. Bye. Bye.